This week on Oklahoma Horizon. Well, you're in for a special treat. Today, we're at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. This is a one-of-a-kind facility that's home to classic and contemporary Western art as well as exhibits that tell America's story as it unfolds across the West. We will attend some of their biggest events and meet some of the men and women who have helped perpetuate the American West. Stay with us for our Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll step inside the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City, and you can feel you are somewhere special. From the magnificent end of the trail sculpture that greets visitors at the door, to exhibits that range from fine art to historical firearms, this museum is a treasure trove of delights for anyone who has the slightest appreciation for the American West. For more than 50 years, the museum has honored those individuals who work to preserve the values that are inherent to the Western way of life with their annual Western Heritage Awards. And today, we'll meet some of the latest inductees, which includes actors, writers, artists, and even a scientist. But we begin today with a man who played larger than life characters, yet remained humble and down to earth. And while he was Western through and through, he didn't gain his notoriety wearing a Stetson, but a coonskin cap. When Walt Disney chose an unknown six foot six singing Texan for the role of frontiersman Davy Crockett, was it because he had an eye for raw talent and charisma or for the bottom line? Dad has a, he, a couple of takes on how that worked out. You know, he, one part of him would like to think that Walt Disney was just blown away by his acting potential and then the businessman side of him realized pretty quickly that Walt Disney was a smart guy and figured he could get Fess for a lot less money than James Arness. <laughs> Walt Disney had seen Fess Parker alongside James Arness in a 1954 sci-fi thriller called Them. <laughs> He was said to have been impressed by the earnest sincerity of Fess, portraying a pilot who refused to back down from his incredible story of giant killer ants. It was one of those roles, even though it was a minute and a half, two minutes, maybe max, right time, right place, and the rest was history. But even Walt Disney couldn't have predicted the craze caused by Davy Crockett, which put coonskin caps on kids around the world and turned a humble Texas farm boy into an overnight international sensation. It must have been amazing uh, for him after really, you know, struggling. Is, Soiling in obscurity. <laughs> exactly. Uh, for that to unfold, you know, the way it did. Uh, the thing I'm always amazed about is the fact that he kind of managed to keep his sense of humor about the whole thing. Fess Parker's kids believe it was in fact his sense of humor paired with a quiet strength that made their dad perfect as Davy Crockett. His good looks didn't hurt either and he was quickly cast in several other big screen roles including the tearjerker Old Yeller. It's not all like that. A lot of it's mighty fine and you can't afford to waste a good part fretting about the bad. That makes it all bad. The speech he gives his son when he, when he comes home, it's so much like the dad that we knew. It's really kind of unbelievable uh, how lucky he was with the roles that he got. Dad Johnson was a man, yes, a big man. With an Eli and Ashley remember their father best during his days as Daniel Boone in the late 60s TV series. He'd come home from the set and we'd put on his boots and they were like hip waders on us, you know, and 
he'd have his jacket and everything and we'd wrestle around and he was uh, he had to be away a, a fair amount but he was a really hands-on dad when he was home he really enjoyed the simple things in life for you know for the most part, he was a blue jeans and pickup truck kind of guy. Fess Parker's roots in ranching and an eye for real estate led him to purchase an acreage of his own north of Santa Barbara, near Los Olivos. He was so happy. He had his, his Barker lounger and a little pot-bellied stove and, you know, this tiny little ranch cottage, and he was happy as a clam, so pretty simple taste. That ranch is now the Fess Parker Winery which became the focus of his life after he retired from Hollywood, along with the development of other California properties, including the spectacular Fess Parker Doubletree Complex in Santa Barbara. Uh, we're very fortunate to have what he has contributed and, and the lasting legacy that he's given us you know, in terms of something we all enjoy. Here's to Fess Parker. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, to, to, to Fess. No one will forget his last day at the winery. In the summer of 2010, as he was wheeled in front of the screen at an outdoor viewing of the movie Davy Crockett to a standing ovation. And he was so cute, and he, he took off his hat. And so that was the image that you saw as he moved, moved across the screen and left the winery for the last time. And uh, that was great. He just, he wowed him, you know, to the end. Fess Parker celebrated his 50th wedding anniversary with his wife, Marcella, the following January and passed away exactly two months later. Ashley and Eli say to the end, their father was grateful for the chance to play Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone and determined to live up to the public's expectations. He would sit and visit with people, people who had invariably had a glass or two of wine and could you sign my hat? Could you sign my back? Could you sign my kid? You know, I mean, he was so gracious and just had the stamina even into his 80s. It was unbelievable. Fess Parker is buried on a hilltop in Santa Barbara between his mother, Mackie, and his father, Fess Elisha Parker Sr., in a simple grave marked by the symbol he made famous. Kind of says it all. I mean, that coonskin cap was there at the beginning and it was there at the end and it will be there for all time. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. We'll walk these halls and you can find all types of artwork that grace multiple galleries. But one of my personal favorites isn't even part of an exhibit. This is the museum's Sam Noble Special Events Center a 1,600-square-foot banquet facility that is home to the largest set of triptych paintings in the nation. Completed between 1992 and 1996 by renowned Western artist Wilson Hurley, each giant 18 by 46-foot triptych is a continuous scene. These are dubbed Windows to the West and depict a particular Western location caught at sunset, and all except one have the same horizon line with the light streaming in from, of course, the west. But each year, all the permanent collections are joined by over 300 Western paintings and sculptures by the finest contemporary Western artists in the nation for an event called Pre de West. The Pre de West Art Show is an exhibit that attracts the attention of art lovers, both far and wide. I love this place. Kent Olberg has been exhibiting in Oklahoma City since 1977. The Western art movement gave us an opportunity of show representation of not just cowboys and Indians, but for example, marine life, a biological piece. This is 50 species of marine creatures come together, and it's called interdependency because we all are dependent on each other. And, and to show, to be able to show that in a Western representation show is a great privilege. I love it. Olberg has had a passion for the West his whole life, despite being born in Sweden. I mean, we grew up dreaming about the West, you know. As kids, we loved the West, Westerns and stuff. Played in the cowboys, you know, of course. Today, Olberg crafts works that depict nature, a love since he was a young man which is also what initially drew him to Western art. So I started by going to art school as a young man. The only thing is that in the 60s, realism was not, not allowed. 
it was not considered fine art. And, and I'm a classicist. I always knew I was born too late. I grew up in a fishing village. You know, I love nature. And so uh, my teacher said, you know, you'd never make a living sculpting animals. You know, why are you doing this? And he's a kind man, and I could feel his concern. I bought it, and I went to the museum and became a museum exhibit specialist and a taxidermist. So I was still sculpting animals, but, you know, for taxidermy. And not until I came to this country did I realize I could live my dream. Texas coast. A dream that motivated him to continue his passion. And then I met artists that exhibited. They were Western subject matter artists, and they invited me to this show. And of course, that gave me an opportunity to dream my, live my dream, to make a living with my sculptures, you know, which I would do even if it was illegal, I'd be sculpting, you know. The Pre de West exhibit gives Olberg the opportunity to show his craft while it gives others the chance to learn about Western history and the culture. What we have seen is only in television, so we don't see the actual world, what it is. Ginny and Aaron are from Finland and are here for the first time. I do not know much about like the Western cowboys or something like that so it's been interesting to uh, learn about it yeah it's a real big part of your history that's why because mm -hmm. yeah and we don't have it in Europe giving visitors a glimpse into the American West through the eyes of the artist that depicted so well well not all the artwork you find here actually hangs on the walls Inside this museum, you can find rare and historic firearms that are excellent examples of the mechanical and decorative arts of the second half of the 19th century. And it's one such craftsman who was honored this year with the award named after the museum's founder, Chester Reynolds. Museum Legendary founder. country and western singer Red Steagle introduces us to the late Jerry Cates. Ask anyone who knew Jerry Cates to tell you about the spurs he made and they'll tell you first about what kind of man he was. Eventually, they'll get to talking about the quality of his work, which boils down to the fact that he was a cowboy who made spurs for cowboys. Jerry's extraordinary craftsmanship speaks for itself and is as dependable as the man who made it. All right, Jerry Cates. All of which explains why Jerry Cates' work is a prized commodity at auctions like this one throughout the West. This is a great piece right there. Now, a true gentleman. He was very humble about his superior, really superior ability to create something that is usable, but is pretty to look at. He just had an easiness, a calm about him, just a very pleasantness about him. But he was uh, diligent at what he did and his artistic at what is his craft. He was his worst critic, and if he didn't like it, he would be thrown out there in the junk pile and you never saw it again. And he would start over. So anything that he sent out, he liked. And I think that's uh, the most thing about him, that he was nearly a perfectionist. Jerry Cates was a dad, a husband, a cowboy, and a spur maker who lived the kind of life a man could hang his hat on. I guess we all miss him, but that goes with it, you know. Uh, we have all this that we have left of him, and that's good, and it will last a long time. And his wife tells us it was a cowboy's life on a cowboy's budget that Jerry honed his craft early on. He couldn't even afford his own work because they sold for all of $25. And today, those same spurs are worth in the thousands. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, we get a taste of the annual Chuck Wagon Festival. But first, a cowgirl at heart who changed the world. Well, diagnosed with autism as a toddler, Temple Grandin grew into a young woman who is quite simply a cowgirl with a vision of how animals see the world. She was able to translate that vision to the rest of us. And the result, a revolution in the cattle industry and too many honors to count. The latest being an inductee into the Hall 
of great Westerners. Temple Grandin was born in Boston in 1947 into a post-war world with little understanding of autism, but a supportive family, good teachers, a love for animals, and an obsession that led to a calling would plunge her down a path that reinvented the cattle handling industry and forced the world to reconsider the boundaries of autism. During a summer visit to her aunt's ranch in Arizona, young Temple became obsessed by the squeeze chute used to hold cows in place for inoculation. She noticed the cattle relaxed once they were in the chute and wondered if a similar gadget could help calm her own sometimes overwhelming anxieties. She designed a human squeeze machine still used today by persons with autism. But that was just the beginning. The process made her realize that as a result of her autism, she shared some visual experiences and panic responses with herd animals. That vision led her to pioneer a new approach to cattle handling that included solid walled, curved chutes with non-slip flooring to prevent overstimulation and agitation within the herd. The handling systems that she's designed I've been in multiple facilities myself and with Dr. Grandin, watched them working. The calmness that the animals exhibit makes all of her, her life's work worthwhile. It's estimated that half the cattle processed in North America pass through facilities designed by the towering figure now known as Dr. Temple Grandin. She introduced an entirely different way of doing things and talking about things and measuring things in terms of animal well-being and, and behavior. You can't name anybody else in the world that does what she does. The combination of, of thought and practicality and dedication to the animals and relationship with the industry and so forth Dr. Grandin is an internationally acclaimed speaker, author, and Colorado State University professor whose simple philosophy that nature is cruel but we don't have to be has become an industry mantra. Her professional accomplishments transcend the cattle business and offer a model of success for those in the autism community. When my son was diagnosed in 1990, the very first book that I read was Temple's book. She took what her experiences were, she gave them to us. She wrote about them, she talked about them, she shared her life, and that became our beacon. She lives a very important life, and it's impacted me and thousands and thousands of people like me. When HBO turned the story of her early life into a movie called Temple Grandin, millions were captivated by the tale. Got any idea what your major might be? Science, probably psychology. Oh, you don't have to decide just yet, do you? It's bigger than boarding school. That's great. Lots see, of choices. And he's looking at you. So you can see all around without moving his head. So how do you know where he's looking? His ears. He points his ears where he's looking. See? He's looking at you. And he's looking at those cowboys. Something about this movie, something about her story, really reaches to people. And I think it's, you know, they look at it and they, they see this is not the story of someone unlike me, this is the story of someone like me that I can relate to. Trust me, we know how different she is. Different, not less. Different, but not less. I've made television movies, I've, I've made big feature films, you know, some of them costing over hundred million dollars, and I've made very tiny movies. Um, this is the one I'm proudest of, this movie. There is nothing like this. And if I do nothing else in my career, I will have done something really, really worth doing. We know what we see when we look at animals. Temple taught us what they see when they look back. That's her gift. Now, if you'd like to hear more from Dr. Granham, we have a full 20-minute interview with her on our website. Just go to okrising.com and click under this week's Value Added. Well, each Memorial Day weekend, the land surrounding the museum takes on a whole new look of the Old West as Chuck Wagon crews from around the United States prepare some true cowboy favorites for folks to sample. And our Andy Barth was there with his fork in hand. With the horses hitched and the music cued, 
it's time to get cooking. Part of our mission is to capture the heritage of the American West and deliver that, if you will, to interested people all over the world. I, I, I've told people Chuck Schroeder is the executive director for the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum and says the Chuck Wagon Gathering is a time for good food and education. There's nothing like a genuine experience of eating Chuck Wagon cooking off the back of a Chuck Wagon prepared by genuine Chuck Wagon cooks. It delivers a message not only about the fun of the American West, but it helps young people understand uh, what a challenge it was for people who came to this unsettled piece of real estate and built their lives, built a culture, built an economy out of nothing but the natural resources that they found there. And helping spread the message of the American West is Chuck Wagon Cook, Trammel Rushing. Yeah, don't teach, teach history and stuff, and especially Chuck Wagon stuff in school anymore, so uh, we'll try to keep it going. Yeah, we've got it passed down to our kids. They're working here. Their kids are working here. Everybody works, everybody gets paid. The little ones, they wash dishes, and that's part of their chore money. A family affair that cooks up a tempting aroma. I'm cooking uh, fried beef uh, with onions and potatoes. I've got a Mexican type stew, and we've got uh, beans over here with potatoes stuck in it, Mexican spices and stuff. So, pretty good. Going back in time for a home cooked meal. Oklahoma Horizon is now portable. Just subscribe to our weekly podcast visit iTunes.com where you can download our show for your listening or viewing convenience. Now we're here in the Western Performers Gallery. Inside this 4,000 square foot exhibit are various ways the West has been interpreted in literature and in film, including the John Wayne collection of personal firearms, artwork, and memorabilia. Now many of the same stars you can find in here also come out in force to present at the annual Western Heritage Awards. And inducted into the Hall of Great Western Performers this year is an actor who has appeared in just about every genre on television. But it is his work in Westerns that gave Bruce Boxleitner his start and a place to come home to. Bruce Boxleitner was bitten by the horse bug early in life. He always loved horses and wanted to live in cowboy country even though he grew up in the corn and dairy country of northeastern Illinois. We raised hay, corn, lots of corn, fields and fields of corn. I was a cowboy, all right. I went with a stick and a dog and went and brought the cows home at night for milking. Would walk them in. I didn't have a horse to do it on, but I was a cowboy. I mean, I went and got the cows. That was a great thing. Eventually, Bruce had horses of his own and enjoyed sharing rides with everyone in the family but his way west came via the stage. Now all that make-believe that I had done out in front of farm animals, <laughs> my first audience, they were captive. Um, I now had, um, somehow I got on the stage and, uh, in high school and I just felt this is what I wanna do. I came out to the west coast on a one-way ticket. I figured it'd be pretty warm there if I had to sleep on park benches or something like that. I never had to. I was very, very fortunate, and I came out, and I had an agent, and I started to get little parts. And the first part that I got was five lines on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. I don't know if these are the perfect circumstances, but would you like to go to a movie tonight? That got me my SAG card, my after card. All my paycheck went to get me in that. And um, before long, I was doing Beretta. I was doing all those shows at the time. Little, I was playing punks and all kinds of fun parts. That's when Bruce got the role he says changed his career and his life. James Arness chose him from a group of 20 actors for a role in what would become the miniseries How the West Was Won. So I'm standing there in the middle of Utah in these red rock canyons with James Arness and I'm on a horse and he's this big mountain of a man. And you know, every once in a while having to pinch myself going, I cannot believe I'm actually doing it. This is my boyhood dream come true. Now after that, Box Leitner played a variety of Western sidekicks and characters before landing the lead role in the sci-fi movie Tron. But the role that probably won him the most loyal fan base is the lead role opposite Kate Jackson 
in the popular 80s TV show, Scarecrow and Mrs. King. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, more aerospace jobs are heading to Oklahoma, and we'll take a look at how they'll get here. The incentives played a very key role for us. Uh, we were able to offer them the uh, federal incentive of the new market tax credits because the Merck Cruiser facility sits in a low census tract. Uh, we were able to offer them that incentive, that federal incentive. Oklahoma show for the heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, there is so much more to see here at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. We just don't have the time to show it all to you. But you can come see it for yourself because the museum is open daily from 10 to 5. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.